Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody, right there where you are. Uh, I am so excited to share some truth with you today that will uh, help you. I'm going to be talking about flourishing in pressured times, flourishing in pressured times. And thank you, Pastor Rod, Pastor Jill, for uh, allowing me to share this morning. And, and I always, I always kind of like to cap off the year and get ready to start a new year. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited about what I'm going to share with you uh, this morning. And, and I, I hopefully it'll be a, a, a real help to you. If you've been under pressure, now if you have not been under pressure this year, you ought to thank God. But most of us have experienced some extreme pressure financially, physically. Uh, you know, I don't know if you saw on the camera when I was coming up the steps, you know, I'm having some knee difficulties. And, and so I've been under pressure in a lot of different areas. And then COVID on top of that, then a crazy election year and all kind of riding in the streets and all kind of pressure. But you know what? I read, when I read the Bible, I see in the Bible that in the end, we win. So we're not concerned. We're going to win. We're more than conquerors in Jesus. But, you know, pressure is a part of life. You know, I was thinking about this. If you do not deal with pressure, now listen to this. If you do not learn how to deal with pressure, you will explode. You will explode one day. It'll build up to the place where you explode, you come unglued, uh, you know, destruction happens and all kind of difficulties will take place. I remember years ago, this is back in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, in our family uh, construction business, uh, we, we uh, needed a air compressor, you know, one you hook up tools to and you work on automobiles or, excuse me, uh, trucks and, and all kind of vehicles. And so we didn't have one. And so one of the guys that worked for us, uh, he said, well, I can, I can build one. So we thought, okay, let it, let's let him try to build one. So he took a tank off of a, uh, a well pump and he took an air compressor off of a car and he took an electric motor and he made us a... Um, air compressor. So we had it out in the shop one day and, and, uh, you know, he was working with it and he plugged, you know, he plugged that thing in and got it going and it was building up. And all of a sudden I'm thinking this thing's not cutting off. And all of a sudden it exploded. I'm talking about it knocked holes as big as golf balls in, in the side of that metal shop, that metal building. My mother worked in the office. Mom was probably watching. She remembers it very well. She was working in the office, and she come running out, seeing what happened, and believe me, she scolded us big time, big time. When mama speaks, everybody knows, everybody listens when mama speaks. And anyway, so, um, you know, I learned some lessons from that. You know, this, this guy who meant well didn't know what he was doing. And a lot of times when we're dealing with pressure, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know what we're doing. And another thing that I realized through that was, that it needed a pressure regulator. And that was a problem. He did not have a proper pressure regulator on that. And it had no way to release pressure. And when it had no way to release pressure, it blew up. You know what? And we do the same thing. If we do not apply, and I'm telling you, I'm going to give you some very practical things today some things that you can apply starting today, not two weeks from Tuesday, not next week, but you can actually apply these things today and begin to release some pressure that you may be, that may be building up your life. Another thing I learned from that, you know, pressure when you explode can hurt people and actually can even kill people. And so I want to give you some things this morning that will help you release some pressure. Now, if you, if you, uh, you know, are not under pressure, been under pressure, you know, you can just, you know, pass this information on to other people, you know, send them the link to this, this later on and, and they can watch it because if you don't need it, you ought to, like I said, you ought to worship and thank God that you don't need it. But I know that I need it. Most people that I know need it. So let's jump right in. Now look at what it says in, in John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, these things I have spoken unto you. Now, I don't have time to go back and read everything that he said in John 16, but you ought to go back sometime and read what he said because he said, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In other words, he says, the things I just communicated to you are things that will bring peace into your life. Let me just give you a, a couple of them. These won't be on the screen. I jotted these down. In verse 1, he said, I speak these things to you uh, and that, that you will, so that you will not be offended and be intimidated. 
You know, Jesus said, I've got some news. I've got some things. If you apply to your life, you won't be intimidated. You, you, you will not be manipulated. You will not be offended. In verse 7, and again, I'm just touching the high spots of what he said. You know, he said, uh, it, it's better for you. He told the disciples, it's better for you if I go away. And man, you just think about it. Jesus had been their source of income. He had been their source of everything. And now he turns and says, it's going to be better for you when I go away. Because he says that I will send another comforter, one of the same kind. And he's not only going to be with you, but he's going to be in you. And we're living in that day. We're living in the day where God is not just with us, but he's in us. Yes. And then in verse 13, he said, the Holy Spirit will take what I've said and make it clear and understandable to you. You know, Jesus would explain things to people verbally, but he didn't live inside of them. He said, the Holy Spirit will come, the reason you're going to be better off, and he will be able to, for you to make sense out of what I've been telling you. Verse 20, he says, uh, you, you, right now you've got sorrow, and I love this word. I underlined it in my notes when I wrote it down. He says, right now you have sorrow, but when you see me again, you're gonna, it's, your sorrow is going to turn to joy. And then in verse 26, I love this one. He says, when, when I go away, he said, you'll be able to ask anything in my name. He said, and I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. Let me ask you a question with your pressure. Have you really talked to God about it? Rather than whining, moaning, and complaining about it, have you talked to God about your problems? In verse 27, he says, and I love, 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 love this one. He says, the Father loves you just like he loves me. Now, you think about that. God loves you just as much as he loves Jesus. Now, think about that. God loves you just as much as he loved Jesus. You know, I was thinking about it this morning. I, I woke up real, real early. And when I say early, I'm talking about early. And uh, when, when I woke up this morning, I, I was thinking about this. The Bible does not promise us a life without difficulty and a life without pressure. But it does promise us victory over that. Look what it says there. These things I've spoken unto you that you might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. That word tribulation, one of the many things that it means is pressure. So I'm going to read it that way. In the world, you will have pressure, but be of good cheer. He said, I have overcome the world. The Amplified Bible says, I've told you these things. And again, go back and read John 16. He said, I've told you these things, that in me, you may have perfect peace and confidence. Perfect peace and confidence. You know, confidence comes from knowing that you are loved by God and he wants to help you. He said, I've told you these things that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you'll have tribulation or pressure, trials, distress, and frustration. Anybody been frustrated? Listen to what he says. There's good news for you. But be of good cheer. Take courage. Take courage. Reach out and get it. Be confident, certain, and undaunted. That word undaunted means don't be discouraged. You know, don't, don't be forced to abandon your purpose and your, your effort. He said, be certain and undaunted. I have overcome the world. That is what he says. I've deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Now, again, all of us have faced pressure. All of us have faced difficulty this year. At least I think we'll be, probably all of us have. You know, personal pressure. You know, we, we health issues, as I said, and all those things. And then COVID on top of that. Then, as I said, the election and all the riding in the street nonsense and, and all those things. Okay, so when I look at that, you know, Jesus really did mean it when he said, I've got a plan that will help you overcome that. Now, you know, let me tell you this. I don't know where you are, who you, if you're part of movement, not part of movement. But see, sometimes people get the idea that people in ministry, I was telling our Bible school students this, you know, a few weeks ago, that somehow that people get the idea that people in ministry live in a bubble, under a bubble where things don't get to them. 
You know, Janice and I had, you know, had people to say this to us and about us through the years. And, and they'd say, well, you know, you don't live. I remember one case in particular, a good friend said, you know, you and Janice just don't live and understand how real people live. I thought, real people? I mean, I think we're about as real as you can get. What do you mean real people? Well, you know, you, you, uh, you, you fly all over the country and you do all this stuff and, you know, and talking about in ministry. And trust me, I'd, I'd lot rather be home sleeping in, in my house, in my bed with my wife, with my kids and grandkids than flying across the country. And they said, you just don't understand how real people live. You know, you, you, know you, you don't have the problems that everybody else faces every day. I thought, are you kidding me? You know, and I said to this person, and I've said it to so many people, you know, uh, directly and indirectly, I said, you know, the only difference between people in ministry and people not in ministry, most people in ministry don't whine and moan and complain about their problems. They don't post it on Facebook. Janice and I, we don't talk about our problems to anyone other than people that can pray with us, stand with us, and jerk us up by the bootstraps if we need it, and tell us, get alive, get a hold of God, and, and move on. But see, a lot of times people don't think pastors and people in ministry go through things. Your pastor, whether it be pastors Rod and Jill, who are our family, our kids, whether, you know, it, no matter who the pastors are, let me tell you something. They go through things just like you do. The only difference is they do not whine, moan, and complain about it and post it on Facebook trying to get pity. Now, I know that's straight and that's, that's, that's hard, but I'm telling you, all you're doing is digging your grave a little bit deeper when you moan, complain, and gripe about where you are. Stop that nonsense, if, if I mean, unless you want to keep it. You know, if you want to keep it, just keep on doing what you're doing and get used to it because you're going to have a lot of it to deal with down the road. Okay, now, okay, so, everybody doing all right? Okay, good. Okay, how can we flourish in pressured times? Number one, keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourself in the love of God. Now, what do I mean by that? You know, we know that we can't get outside of the boundaries of God's love. God's love never ends. But really what, you know, what I'm saying here is that, that look what Jude 121 says. He says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy, God's willingness and desire to treat you better than you deserve, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, so what I'm talking about here is keep yourself in the love of God. Keep an awareness in your heart that you're loved unconditionally by God. And I was thinking about this yesterday. I was working on my notes yesterday, and, and, I, and I thought about this. If you do not believe you're loved unconditionally, you have nowhere to go when you need help. What do you mean? Because if you don't believe God's love is unconditional, you probably think your problem, the difficulties that you're going through, is because of what you've done. Now, it may be consequences, but I'm talking about you look at it as being the judgment of God. You know, the judgment of God was poured out on Jesus 2,000 years ago, thank God. So you and I do not have to deal with that mindset that God is out to get me. If God was out to get you, he already would have gotten you. But thank God he got Jesus on our behalf, thank God. Now, so you do this by Ephesians 5 says, verse 18 and following, actually it's just sums up his worship. Be not drunk with wine, where is it it says, but be filled with spirit. Speaking to yourselves in, in hymns, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart unto the Lord. Wow. Giving thanks always for all things unto God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. You know, the number one pressure reliever, the number one pressure reliever is getting your heart rooted and grounded in God's unconditional love. Unconditional love means you treat someone no different no matter what they do. You know, we don't do that, but God does that. God loves us unconditionally. And you've got to remind yourself of the price that he paid. Number two, how can we flourish in pressure times? Number two, remember pressure is not from God. That's what I'm saying. Pressure is not from God. God's not trying to teach you some kind of sick, goofy lesson. God is not trying to work something mystical into your life through the difficulties that you're going through. COVID is not God's judgment on planet Earth. Listen to what I'm saying. That's not the judgment of God. God is not into destroying lives. He's into helping lives. He's into rescuing us, as the Message Bible says, and throwing us a party. That's what he's into. 
the Psalm, yeah, this won't be on the screen, but Psalm, uh, uh, or it's not in your notes there, Psalm 34, 8 says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Yes. Just taste and see that he's good. And that word good means gracious, loving, sweet, the best. James 1, verse 13 and, uh, and following. Now, I'm going to read it because it means many things, but it also means pressured. I'm going to read it as pressured. Let no man say when he's pressured that I'm being pressured of God. For God cannot be pressured with evil, and neither pressureth he any man. But every man is pressured when he's drawn away with his own lust and enticed. And when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. When sin is finished, it bringeth forth death. Now, listen what verse 16 says. Do not get in error, my brothers. Do not get in error, my brothers and sisters. Every good gift, every perfect gift yeah. is from above, cometh down from the Father, and there, the Father of lights, with whom there's no variableness and neither shadow of turn. In other words, God does not even move enough to cast a shadow. God does not move enough to cast a shadow. See, current pressures can cause you to forget God's past faithfulness. So I'd encourage you to keep a journal of what God's done for you. And then on one of those doom and gloom days where you just feel like slapping somebody for no reason, you just pull that journal out and you begin to read all the things that God has done for you. So that word tempted means pressured. Now, Isaiah says... Isaiah, excuse me, I'm getting, getting ahead of myself here. Bear with me here, getting out, of, getting out of order here. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm right, I'm right. Okay, Isaiah 54 says, Behold, again, it's not pressure, it's not from God. God's not putting pressure on you. Behold, Isaiah 54, 15, Behold, they shall gather together, but not by me. In other words, the enemy's going to come against you, but it's not me. Listen, it's not God. It's not God doing it to you. It's not God, you know, working some kind of, as I said, some kind of spiritual lesson in your life. He said, not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against you shall fall for my name's sake, Listen, or, or for thy sake. Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Yes. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. You've got to take authority yes. Over any voice that tells you God's out to get you, God's creating this, God did this, God's working something because of what you did. There may be consequences to what we've done, but it's never God doing it to us. He said, it may come against you. He said, but it's not from me. He said, you shall condemn it. He said, because this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, their righteousness is of me. Number three, always... Follow God's instructions, always. You know, even when it doesn't make sense, you follow God's instructions. It's like it's a backwards kingdom, as I've said so many times. It's a backwards kingdom where it works opposite to the way the world works, okay? Notice what it says in in, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Now, Paul says, this light affliction, mm, which is but for a moment, worketh for us, a far more exceeding eternal way to glory while we look not at the things that are seen, but that which is not seen for the things that are seen are temporal, subject to change, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Now, look, listen, I didn't have this in the notes. I just pulled it out right before I came to, over to the church. Now, Paul said these light afflictions. Let's just look, read just a little bit of what he went through. This is found in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 and following. He said, I've worked harder and been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received of the Jews 40 lashes minus one. In other words, 39 stripes, five different times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night in the day in the open sea. In other words, floating around on on a piece of wood or something. I have been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from, from the rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger in the sea, in danger of false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. 
I've known what it's like to be hungry and starving and thirsty. And often, you know, I've went without food. I know what it's like to almost freeze to death. He said, but, but besides these things, I faced the pressure of all these churches that I'm dealing with. But what did he say about it? He said, this light affliction, it's just for a moment, works for us. Listen, what you're going through can work for, now God didn't do it. It can work for you if you get your attention on the right thing. If you allow what you're going through to put your attention on God, to put your attention where it should be, because everything you see with your eyes is temporal, it's subject to change. It's not going to stay this way. It's going to change. He says, while we look not at the things that are seen, it will work for me. This is God's instructions. If we're going to relieve the pressure, we've got to follow his instruction. His instruction says when we're under the gun, when we're under pressure, don't look at what you see. Don't sit around moaning and groaning about what you see. He says, for while we look not at the things that are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things that are seen are temporal, subject to change, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When pressure comes, God says, don't look at your problem. Look at the solution. Look at the answer. Look at his way out of this. Look at what God says about it. Because you can get so consumed with your problems, you forget how blessed your life is. I've said it and said it. Most of you have heard me say this time and time again. There's people everywhere that would trade places with you right now. Now, I know that doesn't help you where you are. And you, I know you'd like to reach through the screen and, and slap me right now for saying that. But let me tell you something. You've got to stop looking at how bad your life is. Worst case, worst case, you die. That's a pretty good deal. You go to heaven. That's the reason John said, even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I think all of us have had moments where this would be a real good day for Jesus to come and, and get us out of here, get us out of this place, okay? All right, so follow his instructions. You know, I won't read this, but I'll, I'll just quote it, part of it to you. In Matthew 23, verse 37 and 38, Jesus said, you know, you've killed the prophets, you did this, talking about to Jerusalem. And he said, how often, in verse 37, I would have gathered you together like a mother hen does her chicks, but you wouldn't do it. Now, I want you to listen to what I'm saying. If you do not follow God's instructions, the only thing left is what you can do. Verse 38, he says, listen to this. In verse 37, he said, I don't even know how many times I would have gathered you together, Jerusalem, like a mother hen does her chicks. Follow his instruction, but they didn't do it. He said, therefore, the only thing left for you is destruction. He said, not one of the things that's left for you. He said, the only thing left for you is destruction. That's it. Nothing is left. See, when we do not follow God's instructions, the only thing, not one of the things, the only thing left is destruction. When we reject the wisdom of God, when we reject God's way of doing things, when we say God's way of doing things is useless, it's no value, it's not going to work for me, when we do that, we're saying we know more than God. It's kind of like God you know, talked to Job about his situation. He said, Job, are you going to continue to blame me so you can appear that you're right? Job, where were you when I created the world? You know so much. You know, if you think you know more about how to do this than I do, where were you when I spoke everything into creation? You weren't here, Job. Yeah. And how dare you to try to tell me what works? God's word still works in 2020. It'll work in 2021. It'll work from now into eternity. God's way works. You've got to follow God's instruction. If you want to relieve the pressure, if you want to relieve the pressure, you've got to begin to do it God's way. And if you don't do it God's way, the only thing left, the only thing, not one of the things, the only thing left, and it breaks my heart to think about it, is destruction. Wow. The only wow. thing. Wow. Number four, live looking and moving forward. Live looking and moving forward. In other words, do not live in the past. Do not live in the past. You know, the purpose 
And the goal of pressure is to get you to stop moving forward, to stop trusting God. I tell you what, I, I am so thankful for Movement Church. You know, Janice and I, you know, we, we just get blown away uh, about all the outreach and things that Movement does locally and around the world. And, you know, in a time where in, in many circles of Christianity, people are cutting back and not doing as much. And, and you know, this could be the church's greatest hour. You know, this could be the church's greatest opportunity to reach out and touch. And, and it, it, it just amazed, has amazed Janice and I th- over the last year in particular how that movement moved forward, not backwards during times of pressure, during times of difficulty. And you've got to do the same thing. You know, when, when you get under a, a financial bind, it's not a time to stop giving. You know, when, when you, 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 we have to do it God's way, live moving forward. And Paul talks about that in Philippians chapter three. He said, I, I count myself, I don't count myself to apprehended, but there's one thing I do. He said, I, I've, I've learned one thing. I know how, listen to this. I know how to forget the things that are behind me and reach forth to the things that are before me. Yeah. If you want to relieve pressure, reach out and touch people. Give your life away. If you give your life away and, and, and look to the future, look to the future. Jeremiah, listen to this. Jeremiah says in 2911, the Message Bible, God says, I love this. He says, I, I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not to abandon you. Plans to give you the future you have hope for. And then the Bible says in Matthew 24, it says, verse 42, give strict attention, be cautious and active. And that word active means move forward with speed, participate in energetic work. And then number five, this is so important. If we're going to relieve the pressure, don't forget how to laugh. Don't forget how to laugh. Man, I, I just so wish that, um, People could just see how crazy. Well, you probably already know that. How crazy our family is. Uh, you know, around around when we get together, it's loud. It's it gets too loud for me sometimes. I kind of slip away, and an hour later, somebody say, "Where's Dad? Oh, he's off in the bedroom. He can't. He can only take it in doses, you know." But it's loud, crazy, and 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 a lot of fun. You know, don't forget how to laugh. I remember back in the '80s, one time we were under a lot of pressure in our ministry, and and we were pretty young in pastoral ministry, and. And Janice, I'll never forget this, Janice, when you said, when's the last time we laughed? When's the last time we did anything but talk about our problems? Wow. Wow. You know, find something to laugh about. Proverbs 17, says, a cheerful heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit makes one sick. You know, it's scientifically proven laughter is medicine. Because God's the one that came up with that, you know. Laughter is medicine. I, I was reading yesterday, it helps your immune system, your respiratory system. Your, your, it reduces stress hormones. Uh, your circulatory system, your, your uh, relaxes muscles, reduces pain. And I love, you know, in Acts 26, I know it's a little bit out of context, but I love the way that Paul, when he stood before Agrippa, King Agrippa, and he said, oh, King Agrippa, he said, um, I think myself happy. In other words, I'm happy to answer you. But you know what? I read that statement years ago, and it just jumped off the page. You can think yourself into happiness, or you can think yourself into depression. Find something to laugh about. You know, re, I'm, I'm telling you, we practice this. Janice is always buying joke books. Now, sometimes she has to throw them away. because She bought one. was in Africa one time. She bought one. Clean jokes, and she had to try, she had to throw it away because it wasn't too clean. But anyway, but find things to laugh about. Sh- TV shows or, or jokes or something just to laugh. Learn to laugh at yourself. Yep. Learn to laugh at yourself. Listen to the scripture, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wind it up. Proverbs 15, 15 says, when a man is gloomy, everything seems to go wrong. When he's cheerful, everything seems right. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. He said, This day is holy to the Lord, and be not grieved or depressed, for the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. You know, Pastor, I used to read that verse, and I'd think, the joy of the Lord is my strength? What in the world does that mean? 
the, the, the fact that God has joy is my strength. And, and then I really meditated on it. I mean, for years, I, I couldn't figure that verse out. And really what that verse means when it says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength, it means the gladness of who the Lord is, is your strength. When you see God as he really is, the joy that comes from knowing he loves you unconditionally is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You know, how often do you laugh? I read this yesterday. I was telling Janice last night that it's estimated that a child laughs 400 times a day. Anything from a chuckle to a belly laugh is counted as a laugh, but 400 times a day. The average adult, 15 times a day. You know, you find what you look for. If you look for things in your life to rejoice about and laugh about, you'll find them. You know, in, in laughter, just like doom and gloom, is contagious. It's contagious. I remember one time Janice and I and a, and a, a couple dear friends of ours and uh, this, the man, he's with the Lord now, Craig and Maria Hahn, we were in a restaurant in uh, Florida and Janice and Maria are like two peas in a pod and, and they were laughing so big. And there's a couple sitting over and they kept just looking at us and kept looking at us. And in a minute, they just brought a chair over and sat it down. We was in a booth and set it down at the end of our booth. And the fellow sat down and his wife sat down on his knee and said, we got to know what y'all are drinking. We got to know what, you, what is so funny over here. And so we're not drinking anything. Well, what, what are you laughing about? We've never seen people laugh like this. And so, you know, before long, they were laughing. You know, you're, you're giving out, I hate to say it like this, vibes of doom and gloom or joy and happiness. And most all of that hinges on how you see God. Let me tell you something. For God so loved you, that he gave his son. That if you would believe in him, you wouldn't perish, but have everlasting life. And everlasting doesn't just mean length, but it also means quality. You know, God wants you to have a quality of life on earth where you're not living under pressure. Pressure is going to be there. There's always going to be difficulty. There's always going to be problems. But the question is, where are you putting your attention? How are you handling it? Here's a thought. How's your way working? And if you just feel like you're about to explode, it's time to apply these things and let the pressure go. Let, it, let a relief come into your heart. Yes, yes. So right now I want to pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for relief coming to people. Lord, I thank you that regardless of how difficult and dark their situation may be, it's not bigger than you. Thank you, Father. You're the, you're the God of the breakthrough. You, you're the God of peace. And I speak peace to your emotions right now. I say in Jesus' name, you're letting it go and you're going to have a turnaround in your emotions. If you're with us today and you've stumbled across this or someone, a loved one got you um, watching this with us today and you've never begin a relationship with God through Jesus. I want to pray a prayer. You know, it's not enough to pray the prayer, but you got to believe it. And the Bible says, if you believe in your heart, Romans 10, and say with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he was raised from the dead for you, that you would become a Christ follower and your eternity is then sealed. So just say it with me. Say, Father, thank you that you gave your son for me. And the Bible says, if I believe in my heart and say with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, I'll be saved. I'll become a child of God. And I'm doing it right now. Thank you, Jesus. I receive you right now. Amen.